The Suffolk town of Beckles is a quiet and unsuspecting place with a population of just over 10,000 people. It is the perfect place for a day out if you're visiting the Suffolk coast. One of its largest claims to fame, it is where the parents of naval hero Horatio Nelson were married in 1749. But 102 years after his death, another man would come to walk its streets. He would also join the Royal Navy at a young age, but unlike Nelson, his career would not last long, ending in a mutiny. His life would take him from the quiet streets of Beckles to Union marches, prisons, the blistering heat of the valleys around Madrid and to central London during the height of the Blitz. Fred Copeman was born in 1907 in the Wagford Union Workhouse, where his mother had been forced to move after his father had left the family. He would spend the first nine years of his life here with his older brother George working on the workhouse's farm. In 1916, both boys were moved to a children's home in Ravensmere Road, Beckles. Sadly, the time the boys would have together was coming to an end. George was chosen by the charity Bernardo's to be sent to a family in Canada in order to start a new life. The brothers would never see or have contact with each other again. Fred, lost without his brother, would have a lonely next few years, other than a stray dog he befriended that he called Bonnie. After a few short years of education, mostly focused on making him and the other boys as self-sufficient as possible, Fred would be sent to Watts Naval Training School in North Earlham, Norfolk, at the age of 12, to ready him for a life in the Navy. After two years here, he would be enlisted as a boy sailor for further training at HMS Ganges in Shortley, Suffolk. Opened in May 1865, HMS Ganges was one of the country's most respected naval training centres, with a reputation of turning boys into professional, hard-working and self-reliant sailors, but was often questioned about its harsh training and disciplinary methods, with its main feature being a 143-foot tall ship's mast and rigging that the boys were required to climb as part of their training. It is no surprise that this would lead to many deaths over its years of service. His training complete, Fred's first posting would be to HMS Valiant, part of the Mediterranean fleet docked at Malta. He would find himself greatly affected by the levels of general poverty among the Maltese people and his feelings would begin to grow that something must be done. During this posting, Fred would become a keen boxer, like so many other young men in the fleet. He would often take part in boxing matches against shipmates or locals for some extra money. However, he was seen as a dependable and helpful sailor in his early career and would serve as the captain's runner before a practical joke gone wrong would land him for three weeks in a Maltese prison. His next few years in the Navy would be uneventful, with him serving as ship steward aboard HMS Emperor of India and HMS Royal Oak, until events caused by the Great Depression would bring him forward again. Now serving the Atlantic Fleet aboard HMS Norfolk, anchored off Invergordon, Scotland, on the 11th of September 1931, Copeman and his shipmates would soon learn of cuts to wages. To make matters worse, they were reading them in the newspapers before they were being told it officially. Fred would later write, It came as a complete surprise when newspapers were read throughout the ships, indicating that in most cases the lower ranks would lose more than senior ranks. The actual pay reductions were Admiral 7%, Lieutenant Commander 3.7%, Chief Petty Officer 11.8%, and Able Seaman 23% of wages cut. Anger soon spread through the fleet, with some of the most famous and respected ships in the Royal Navy now on the verge of mutiny. Among them was HMS Hood, the flagship of the Royal Navy. The mutiny would begin proper on the 15th of September, when sailors from HMS Hood refused to put the ship to sea. The feeling soon spread faster than officers could react, from ship to ship. Sailors were gathering on the forecastles or in the galleys and the canteens, refusing to work. Even parties of Royal Marines sent in to get the crews back to work would down tools and join them. On board HMS Norfolk, the strike committee was led by Fred Copeman and another able seaman, Len Wincott, a man who would later defect the Soviet Union in 1934, would survive the siege of Leningrad in the Second World War and 11 years in a gulag before dying in Moscow in the 1980s. The mutiny passed surprisingly peacefully, especially for someone like Fred, a man who was more used to solving his problems with his fists than his words. It was also noted that the men remained respectful to their officers throughout. The two-day strike would end with the government backing down 
and promising to make the pay cuts more equally. But the Navy does not take kindly to mutineers. Dozens of men were imprisoned and hundreds, including Fred and Len, were thrown out of the Navy with nothing more than their clothes on their back, 13 shillings and a rail warrant home. For many, this was the ending of their professional lives, with little waiting for them in a depression wrecked country. But for men like Fred and Len, this was a whole new beginning. The mutiny was a turning point. I began to understand the meaning of leadership, and even more important, the meaning of politics. Although the mutiny was not, in the minds of those who took part in it, political, I could not fail to be affected politically by it. The Communist Party had not neglected to notice those who took any leading part in Invergordon. Wincott immediately started to work for the International Labour Defence, an organisation in the control of the Communist Party. Some months later, I myself linked up with and both of us joined the party itself. Most politicians are egoists, and I am more than most. At Invergordon, I had tasted leadership and felt the thrill of power, which comes from the willing support of thousands of followers. The party were quick to observe this and draw me into active association with them. It was not long before I was in the thick of the political battle on their side and liking it. Now discharged from the Royal Navy, Fred would move to Deptford in London and become a rigger in the London dockyards, where he would join the Transport and General Workers Union and become affiliated with the National Unemployed Workers Movement and the Electrical Engineering Union. He would take part in many pickets and protests outside of employment exchanges and other government buildings over the next few years. In order to combat this, the government made marches of this kind illegal. Undeterred, Fred would soon carry on and find himself serving multiple sentences. He would serve time in Wandsworth and Brixton prisons before serving four months hard labour in Wormwood scrubs. While focusing on trying to make a better life for working people at home, Fred, among others, would soon have their attentions drawn to the south of Europe, where a military coup against the Spanish Republic had spiralled into full-out civil war with a desperate government calling for help. Fred would sail for Spain on the 26th of November 1936, bidding goodbye to his friends and by extension his country, as many saw the men and women leaving to fight as nothing but traitors. Arriving in Spain in February 1937, he joined the British Battalion, the 16th Battalion of the 15th International Brigade, fighting alongside thousands of volunteers from all over the world. Like many organisations fighting in the Spanish Civil War, the British Battalion seemed to attract a wide range of people to its ranks, such as Bill Alexander, the future Assistant General Secretary of the Communist Party of Great Britain, Lewis Clive, an Olympic medalist, Bert Yank Levy, who would go on to train the Home Guard in the Second World War, and Annie Murray, a Scottish nurse and one of the first volunteers, all fighting alongside with communists, socialists, poets, philosophers, and veterans of the First World War. No matter their reason for being there or political persuasion, they would all soon face the fire outside Madrid in the Battle of Rama. The battle itself was fought to try and stop the forces of the nationalists from capturing the river Harama east of Madrid. The city had been under siege since November of 1936. A large part of the fighting at Harama, around the area of the Pinagora Hills, would fall to foreign troops on both sides, with British, American, Russian, Irish, French and Germans fighting off attacks from Spanish legionnaires, Moroccan troops and their own Irish brigade who had joined the nationalists to fight for Catholic Spain. The fighting was brutal, confusing and with heavy losses. Of the 600 members of the British battalion that entered the battle, 357 would be killed or wounded, including their commander. Survivors of the battalion would come to call the ground they had fought so hard for, Suicide Hill. Among the wounded was Fred Copeman, hit in the head and arm, but still willing to fight. Under his command was Jason Gunnery, a sculptor, who would write of his time in Spain later, describing the scene. The situation was further disturbed by a self-appointed commander, Fred Copeman, a great bull of a man, clearly visualised himself as a divinely appointed leader by virtue of his immense strength. He had been a heavyweight boxer in the Navy, although he was almost illiterate. Throughout his life, he had used his fists to put himself in charge of any group of men he found himself among. He was completely without physical fear, and it seemed almost entirely indifferent to physical pain. On this occasion, he had received two wounds, one to the hand, the other to the head, 
which he had been tied roughly with field dressings. By this time, he was more or less insane, screaming completely inconsequential orders to anyone in sight and offering to bash their faces if they did not comply. Fortunately, he passed out by the stage he was carried to the rear. The battle would end in a bloody stalemate, with up to 45,000 killed, wounded or captured on both sides, with only nationalist forces making some minor tactical gains. Fred would take time to recover from his wounds and return to the line. Due to further losses taken by the battalion during his convalescence, he would find himself as acting commander, but his wound from Harama would soon come back to haunt him. On the eve of the Battle of Turel, he would be rushed to a field hospital in pain. A small piece of shrapnel that had been overlooked and had left in him had become infected and came close to killing him. Again, he would recover, but with no further use to Republican forces, he was shipped home to England. In many respects, Fred returned a changed man, as did many of the foreign volunteers. Dreams of a glorious people's revolution in Spain were shattered by the infighting they had witnessed. Socialists fought against communists, Communists fought against Marxists, and they all fought against anarchists. Although he would stay a member of the British Communist Party for the time being, his mind would be fully changed in 1938, where as a high-ranking member of the party, he was invited to the Kremlin and to see life in Soviet Russia. Other than a meeting with famed Spanish communist leader Isadora Dolores Unbari Gomez, of no passeran fame, he would be very unimpressed by his time there and the deep divides in the society that he still saw. My general impression of the standard of life of the Russian people is that it was far below that of even the lowest paid workers in Great Britain. It is true there was no unemployment and that many things were being done for the Russian workers which were outside the present possibilities for the British worker. Yet somewhere something very important was missing. Everything seemed to be organised from the top. Our own accommodation and meals were lavish compared to that of the ordinary people. A visit to the Soviet, which I had hoped would give me a renewed inspiration, was making me, if anything, cynical and certainly doubtful to the final success of the party's tremendous economic experiment. On his return home, he would quit the Communist Party and become involved with the Catholic Church, where he was seen as a bit of a novelty as a converted communist. Despite his change of heart, the British government didn't like the idea of trained anti-establishment figures on its streets and he would find himself under surveillance by MI5, with a dossier of 99 pages on him established over the years of his attitudes, friends, contacts and movements. By the end of 1938, the international brigades in which Fred had served were disbanded. With defeat of the Second Spanish Republic inevitable, many returned home, only to find themselves watched and spied on by their own governments. A few would stay in Spain and fight with other Republican units until the war's bitter end in April 1939. But for Fred, the autumn of 1939 would bring him into another war with a fascist enemy, only this time he would find his country standing beside him. Fred would volunteer as an air raid warden in London, where his experience in Spain would become invaluable, even if sometimes it ran opposite to the official stance of the government. He in particular didn't care for the government's decision to make the evacuation of children from London a voluntary one in June 1940. Speaking at a meeting of the National Baby Welfare Council, he stated, In Spain, I witnessed Hitler bombing towns which were being evacuated, and I said to myself over and over again, if only those people had gone when they had a chance. If you depend on sentiment and rely on mothers to send their children away, you will get nowhere. Naturally, they do not want to be parted from their children if they can help it. But if you make it compulsory, mothers after the first raid will bless those who sent their children away. Fred would serve as a manager for the shelters in the deeper stations of the underground in Westminster throughout the height of the Blitz. With his position and prior knowledge, also meaning he was chosen to give several lectures on air raid safety to the royal family in Buckingham Palace a long way from the rundown workhouse he had grown up in. For his services during the Second World War, Fred would receive the OBE in 1946. He would write his autobiography, Reason in Revolt, in 1948. He would remain in politics, becoming a Labour borough councillor in Lewisham, but would be unsuccessful in the 1949 London County Council election and the 1950s general election. He would remain heavily involved with trade unions for the rest of his life. Fred Copeman would have four children with his wife, Kitty Barnes, who he married after his return from Spain, and would pass away in 1983 in London, aged 76. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. This was Fred Copeman, mutineer, 
activist, traitor and hero. And this is a little bit of history.